So we're now going to hand over to the first panel, which is IRR50 and the Revolutionary Acts. So thank you so much for being here. Round of applause for the first panel. OK, everyone. Welcome to the first panel. And what we're going to do is a bit of the first morning is a bit backwards facing, but in order to go forwards, right? Because we don't know where we're going until we know where we've been. So in a sense, what we're going to do today is have a little discussion between the deputy editor of Race and Class, the formidable energy of the IRR, that is Jenny Bourne, and the legend that is... <laughs> Sorry, it was an in-joke with Colin because someone called it's him a legend, a very bad in -joke. Sorry. <laughs> the, the chair of the IAR, Colin Prescott. And what we're going to do today is kind of put into context how the Institute in itself changed radically 50 years ago. Um, and just to put this into current parlance, lots of us will attend stuff where we talk about decolonizing institutions, yeah? And normally that just means making some black and brown managers who get paid a lot of money and, you know, you throw some stuff on a reading list. But in a sense, the Institute of Race Relations is a decolonized institution because it essentially began as a imperialist or well, neo-imperialist think tank, right? Rooted in the objective studies of race relations, rooted in a kind of idea that you could scientifically manage this and also link to the most heinous people on the planet, right? Multinationals, the British government. And then in 1972, the workers of the institution essentially overthrew all of this. And now we are, in a sense, this anti-racist think tank that has a wonderful history, has a wonderful history of research, has a wonderful history of praxis. And we need to keep that history alive and we also need to keep the Institute alive. So like Sophia says, uh, never be too shy with your money. All right, so without further ado, we'll hand over to Jenny first, I think, and then Colin. Yeah. And I'm just sitting here to do something. All right. Can I be heard? Uh, okay, so I guess I'm here really as a, as a relic. I'm a relic of that um, event in 1972, and I think I'm the only person in this room, apart from Gus, um, who was also there uh, 50 years ago to make history. So I'm really just going to be very brief and um, be here as a sort of elder, keeping the community's history alive and being your storyteller. And I have to say that that makes me feel very odd because when we were there 50 years ago, and I'm talking about being on the IRR staff, and I was extremely junior, and our membership and community supporters took on a governing board of funders and very vested interests, as John has said. But we had absolutely no idea then that the Institute would last. We were there like many organizations at the time. I mean, try and imagine the time. It was a time of women's liberation, of the Vietnam Solidarity Campaign, campaigns against poverty, homelessness, in students rising up in universities saying they didn't want to take exams because those were very reactionary. And yes, we were to be part of the cliche, telling truth to power. It was, as it were, our duty to subvert. So there was nothing particularly revolutionary in, in our feeling at that time when we took on the powers at the Institute. And I want to say a little bit about um, how we live to tell the tale today. Um, the actual writing up of the history of the changing of the Institute has been done by SIVA and is available um, in race and class and other places. So. I need to reiterate what it meant that transformation. We're not allowed to use the word coup because that might be political. But in terms of understanding what happened, I want to talk about the way it changed the view of racism. It said that race relations was not about getting those new Commonwealth citizens to fit in and the hosts become a little more tolerant. It was about racism, something structured in the economy, polity, and society. In other words, simple words, black people were not the problem, but white society was. So every day there were skirmishes going on in North Kensington or Brixton, and police were using sus and railroading people into jail. 
And meanwhile, what were we doing at the Institute? We were carrying out an adjustment study to see why so few ethnic minority people were opting to go to new towns. And they were being asked questions such as whether they kept a pet. Apparently, that was very adjusted. But change, the other point that we were trying to say was that change did not come about by tackling attitudes, but in changing the laws which framed society and the media which constructed the discourse about society. Now, when I say all that, it's clear as day today, but then it sounded quite revolutionary. And you don't throw out these powerful leaders of multinationals and media conglomerates and members of the Lords without some sort of comeback. And I just want to talk very briefly about the fight we had to preserve the Institute. Money. First of all, they were connected to everybody who gave us money and they told their cronies not to trust us, not to fund us. And we moved from Mayfair to a basement in Islington, a warehouse where sewage water used to flood us when rains got heavy and rats sat under the desk, literally. But the other part of that was that supporters came and helped us to bail out the water. And we learned how to get by and later how to generate our own king income through our journal and attract funds from smaller but more radical sources, such as the World Council of Churches. And members of community groups kept services going some evenings and weekends. And at a more personal level, we learned too, as our huge and stratified staff had to be made redundant, how to diversify ourselves. I was a junior researcher and suddenly I was bookkeeper, fundraiser, company secretary. Hazel Waters had been a librarian. She became the greatest editor we've ever had on race and class, and I'm sorry, but she's not with us today. She's not well. Liz Fakiti came as a volunteer typist for the library. Today, she's our director. And we also learned to work collectively as a team and not as a different department. So that was money. And now I want to talk a little bit about our public persona. The old guard who had all the power in the media try to portray us as reds, troublemakers, and that didn't end in 1972. As we began to take up pressing issues, be it racism in the curriculum, police brutality, deaths in custody, school exclusions, we were pilloried as lefty loonies. Now that's the new right equivalent of today's wokies and snowflakes. We were accused of starting riots on Broadwater Farm in the 1980s, and Siva exposed as a hoodlum with an iron bar kept in luxury at the taxpayer's expense. We should be closed down by the Charity Commission. Our incendiary materials should be banned. That was all said publicly in, I think, the House of Lords. But the positions that we had taken worked in other ways too. It was dialectical. It brought to the IRR people and organizations from all over the world. Our journal, Race and Class, was supported by leading revolutionary figures, such as Orlando Letelier, who had been in Allende's government, Thomas Hodgkin and Basil Davidson, Jean Carew, Edward Said, Kent Jordan, and had Walter Rodney, Noam Chomsky, Angela Davis, Gail Omvert amongst its contributors. And Barbara Ransby and Miriam Ura, oh. yeah, correct? with us today, who all opposed imperialism and state racism. And our struggle and precept began to influence groups and be influenced by those on the ground, not just like the Southall Monitoring Group, who were with us today, but groups in the Netherlands, Germany, Norway, Khalid is with us today, Canada and Australia. I suppose that ever since April 72, we as an organization have been asking ourselves since we are neither in academe nor at grassroots, but we straddle those worlds, as a progressive educational body, how can we best provide the insights or rather the ammunition that others can then use? What are the issues we need to, to be taking up? How do we do it? Do the old concepts work? Do we need new ones? And to whom are we speaking? 
We are not in the business of just replicating what other groups do, especially those oriented just at policy amendment and in one specific area. We see issues and struggles as intimately linked. We have taken up those issues that others ignore. Often the issues where racism at its most virulent. We have tried then to put those issues on the agenda for others to learn about and take up, whether it be the impact of Europe 1992 and what we called Fortress Europe, the growth of Xena racism, black history as part of British racism, the impact of the technological change on imperialism, the growth of nativisms and populisms and so on. This is not a looking back conference, but a taking stock to know where we are going. And I think there are a few things which came out of our struggle which still stand the test of time. I'll just say them very slowly. Racism does not stand still. It changes its contours and impact all the time. There is no anti-racist blueprint. There's no orthodoxy. And racism does not impact equally. We have to look to the groups and the areas where its impact is felt most and where other factors, class, rightlessness, gender, sex, etc., interlink. We, as an organization, need to be speaking from the most oppressed, the most powerless, not to the policymakers and the most powerful. Finally, we think in order to do. Immanent in our analysis should always be the seeds of how to change things. And many of these precepts you will recognize came from Siva, whom we celebrate this day. But we should be aware that for at least the last 10 years, it has been Liz Fakiti carrying the torch aloft for IRR, thinking afresh, putting new issues on the agenda, making connections, developing networks, and above all, helping to incubate new store fighters for a new age. This day is also dedicated to her. All right, all right Colin. Terrific, Jenny. Um, good morning. <coughs> I've written down a few things so that I don't stray off and because we have a small time. I'm not sure how well I'm going to be able to stick to it. Um, I follow Jenny, Jenny Bourne. Uh, I've always called her the keeper of the record um, from the time I joined or came to the Institute. And it is time that I said publicly in a way this. Jenny was also without doubt Sivan Andon's most stalwart companion in life and in letters. She has been IRR researcher and analyst, as she says, analyst, as well as first, first draft reader of the old man's works. And over the years, her own always authoritative essays have peppered the journal Race and Class, amongst other things, critiquing, sharp critiques of academic sociology's race relations writings. They've regularly appeared in Race and Class. And so she graduated from being assistant editor to lead editor alongside Hazel Waters, as she says. What's more, I'm being risky here, and got permission for this. And this is not common knowledge because little ceremony was made of it. Jenny became Siva's wife many years ago. Now it's out. <laughs> um, I wanted to begin with a little phrase, but I've already heard Jenny say it, or say it in another way. I've heard Sophia say it in another way. I wanted to say, we're not here to reminisce. We're here to recommit. That's why we called the conference. That's why I hope you're here. And looking at all these, I've seen some images, some pictures that the now staff have been putting up and so on. I, I began to, to feel overburdened by this, by this wanting to say this thing. This is not a reminiscence moment. For all the reasons Jenny has begun to say, for all the reasons all the rest of the people speaking here will have, to, will have to say, we have to recommit to this struggle. So let me try to say the few things I, I wanted to say. Um, very small things. 
uh, on the back of Jenny's excellent summary presentation. <laughs> um, I'm here, I guess, as another variety of the old guard, another elder, one who can testify to the truth of Lenny's account, Jenny's account of the founding practice of the new institute after the workers took over 50 years ago. So I thought perhaps I could most usefully give at this juncture a kind of flavor of those times, add to her the sense that Jenny's given, a proof of the pudding, so to speak. A little bit then about how I came to the IRR in those days. You've heard from Jenny that the new IRR sided with the struggles against injustice of the new migrant settler black communities in the 1970s, sided with their justice campaigns and supported their right to challenge the status quo. This was not a comfortable position to take because those communities in challenging were challenging, challenging the status quo for them meant challenging and confronting every day, every day injustices at every turn. These black communities challenged in order to change the very idea of what was acceptable. They challenged and demanded change in and of the systems that they encountered. And black community struggles were popping up in as many places as racism resulted in injustice. In other words, everywhere. The Institute, when it says it's listening to these people, when it says it's inviting in these people, you'd have seen them, they came in the door, uh, uh, was opening itself to trying to keep up with the pace that was being set by these communities. 50 years down the road, we need to remember that the people making struggles in these communities were arriving from the 1950s to the 1970s, in this particular case, from places and long histories of resistance against racist, violent, super exploitative, and impoverishing colonial oppression. In other words, they're arriving from places with long histories of trying to drive the colonialists out and of multiple attempts to restrain the worst excesses of wickedly racist behavior. So these new black communities were constituted of people coming out of militant anti-colonial traditions. This is where they had their authority from. I was one of those, like Liz Fekety, like Francis Weber, who came to the IRR as a volunteer. Liz would have come out of courageous, anti-racist, anti-fascist activism. The courageous is important. Francis would turn herself into the inspired human rights lawyer that she has become in the course of serving the mission of the IRR. I came to the Institute out of those 1970s black community struggles to which Jenny has already referred. There are people sitting around here who were also there ahead of me. I'm, I'm, I, I see immediately Gus. <laughs> okay. uh, I think I must have been, it must have been 1974. I would have been arriving at the door of the IRR's King's Cross basement and ground floor, which indeed did flood. We had to move the books onto top shelves regularly at this point. I came out of my engaged activism as a member of the Marxist-influenced journal, The Black Liberator, just to give you a flavor. At the time, The Black Liberator's editorial collective included its founding editor, AX Cambridge. Do you want to stop me? No, not yet. Girl in Bean, Cecil Gutsmore, Meg Howarth, and in time, Stella Dadzie. Looking back, I'd have to say that my activism also extended to my work as an activist educator at the then Polytechnic of North London. Only giving you flavors, I'm not singing my own song. Where I had devised a course entitled Underdevelopment and the World System a course that was central to what was arguably the most radical Bachelor of Science Sociology degree in the land at that point. At PNL, I recall setting up from time to time in this time, in this culture of our time, programs of talks that were open to polytechnic staff and students as well as to local secondary schools and to anyone else who wished to wander in. These talks were given by radical thinkers like the Jamaican activist historian Richard Hart the sociologist Stuart Hall, 
the Pan-Africanist scholar-activist Cecil Gutzbo, and the publisher-activist John LaRose, as well as by representatives of campaign organizations like the English Collective of Prostitutes and Wages for Housework. Heady days they were. It was one of the Polytechnic Sociology Department, a mature student at the time, Tony Bunyan, later author of a seminal text on policing, the political police in Britain, and founder of the organization State Watch, who personally introduced me to Sivan Anden and the IRR. Race in class, with its publishing agenda, Jenny's just been mentioning, soon became uh, the source of any number of bibliographical references recommended to students taking my compulsory underdevelopment and the world system course. So I became one of those who was influenced by the IRR, impressed not least by the IRR's then director, A. C. Van Anden. He was a brilliant, marvelous man, that C. Van Anden. Fiercely intelligent, passionately comb combative, and with a robust, loving embrace for his friends that could be rough and tough. I also became one of those who would influence how the IRR did its work of metaphorically fueling the tanks of the fighters on their way to the front line, to paraphrase Sivanandan. To give just a single outstanding example, do you need me? To give just a small outstanding exa example of the relationship that it was possible to strike up, I'll, I'll finish as quickly as I can. I'll, I'll make it minutes. No, you take your time. You're good. With the IRR because of its active engagement with black community struggles. By 1978, I was able to engage Sivan Anden with my budding documentary filmmaking practice, specifically in the film Blacks Britannica, on which I collaborated with the accomplished politically radical Californian documentary filmmaker David Koff. And, but by 1982, the IRR was able to use me to make four groundbreaking documentary films. These were works made to be used in black community campaign struggles and also made for broadcast on the then new and progressive Channel 4 TV. The four films that I made, that I directed with for the IRR were titled Struggles for Black Community. They made manifest the idea of black as a political color and they centered on four different sites of black community in Britain. One, 19th century Tiger Bay in Cardiff, another, the town of Southall uh, in, on, the, on the outskirts of London, uh, another on Leicester, the heart of the industrial Midlands, to look at the way in which black struggle took on not just the bosses, but also the unions in order to defend against injustice, and one on Ladbroke Grove, uh, Notting Hill, uh, not least because it was the site uh, in 1958 of one of the country's most notorious uh, so-called race riots, stirred by fascists. Um, the production company, I have to say that the IRR staff, this is what the point of my raising this, all of the research and production work for these documentary films was done by IRR staff. Yet another set of skills that they could turn their hands to. And the production company formed in order to sign the contract with, with Channel 4 was called Race and Class Limited which still brings a smile to my face. As we look back, it's only too clear that these race and class-led documentary films were connected with that most tantalizing intellectual challenge, I'm gonna stop immediately, that Sivan Anden set himself to catch history on the wing. And the films were clearly twinned with his truly seminal essay on black, Asian, and African Caribbean struggles in Britain, from resistance to rebellion. There'll be more on all that in the next session of this conference. I think I should stop because you want to have some chance for a conversation with you. Yeah, thank so you. I'm not, thank you, Colin. <laughs> Given the next panel was supposed to start five minutes ago, we might have to have a short conversation. I don't need to have a conversation. But I actually think that this works, because I think this is the start of the conversation. And in a sense, the panels that follow are the, are the following on of this conversation. Right? So what I will do, see how I did that? See how I, I made it an intellectual thing, but really it's a time thing. Um, <laughs> right? Um, is I would say, can we thank 
because this, 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 there is some looking back, right? And I think at some point there's an intergenerational thank you that can be given, right? Even if we are moving forward together. So I'd like to thank the people that didn't start the conversation but moved the conversation on 50 years ago. And we'll move that conversation on even more as we go throughout the day. So Jenny, Colin, and everyone at IR, thank you.